If you got your Bibles with you this morning, you should now be in Colossians chapter 2. And we're going to pick up where we left off a couple of weeks ago. We're talking this morning about warning against false teaching. And my wife last night was doing the bulletin and she said, is this, which part is this? And I said, I don't know, it's the next part. <laughs> I lost track of that somewhere along the line. But anyway, it's warning against false teaching on mysticism and worshiping of angels. Colossians chapter 2, verses 18 and 19. So, let's read our, our passage here and, and uh, we'll, we'll get started. Verse 18, Colossians chapter 2 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind and not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increases with the increase of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you. We thank you for loving us, Lord. Father, you're so good to us, Lord. Even, even in, in the bad times, Lord, what we think is bad times, you're, you're molding us and shaping us and helping us, Lord, to be what you want us to be. Father, we thank you so much for that. And Father, I thank you for the privilege that you give us of, of assembling together here in, in, in your house, Lord, and, and just uh, studying your word and, and, Lord, having that time of fellowship one with another and, and Lord, just loving on one another. And, and I thank you for that. And Father, just now as we come to your word, Lord, I pray that you would open the eyes of our understanding, Lord. I pray that you would open our hearts, Lord, that we might receive what you have for us this morning. And Father, I know that this message that I'm about to preach is a different type of message maybe, Lord. It's, it's one that we desperately need. And we need to understand these two verses and so, Father, I'd ask you right now, Lord, just to, to teach us from your word. Allow your spirit to guide and direct. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So, today we're going to be looking at these two verses. And they desperately need to be understood by us. Now, I told you when we started the book of Colossians that this is more probably than any other of Paul's epistles written directly to us. And I'll talk a lot more about that when we get into chapter 4. But Colossae was a church that was very much like the church of Laodicea. And we are the church of Laodicea. And I'm not talking about us in the building, but I'm talking about the church as the global church, if you will, the worldwide church. Because we, uh, you know, just go read Revelation chapter 3 and it'll tell you all about us. And, and the way that we uh, look at life. And it's all about us. That's the Laodicean church. And that was the church at Colossae. We'll talk about that. These two verses could very well be titled A Word for America. It could be titled A Word for the World because what's happening here is happening around the world. This is our culture today. We live in a very spiritual place and a very spiritual time. The problem is we have the same problem that the Church of Colossae had. They was very spiritual too. There was just too many spirits involved. See, in America, the folks worship just about everything except the Lord Jesus Christ. They worship the trees. 
the birds, all the animals, they forget about the Creator. We live right in the heart of Romans chapter 1, verses 22 through 25. And here's what it says. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like to corruptible man and to birds and four-footed beasts and creeping things. Wherefore, God also gave them up to uncleanness through the lust of their own hearts to dishonor their own bodies between themselves, who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. That's us today. That is our world today. I don't know if you ever pay attention to the news. If you don't, God bless you. But in California, they're, they're having a terrible drought. And the farmers can't water their crops. But the truth behind it is that there was a little tiny fish that was getting caught up in the screens of the irrigation channels, so they drained them to save these little fish so people can starve to death. But, oh, we saved the fish. That's our world, my friends. That's our world. Worshiping the creature more than the Creator. <clears throat> so by now, you may be asking yourself, why is He bringing all this stuff up? What does this have to do with our text today? And I know you're thinking that because you guys always ask exactly the right questions. And so, you know, I, I knew that's what you was going to be thinking. Because they're both good questions. And if you stay with me to the end, I'll give you the answer. How's that? All right. To understand these two verses, we need to get just a little historical insight into the church at Colossae. Now, I know a lot of times when somebody says history, people's minds shut down because not very many people are really crazy about history. Unfortunately for you, I am. <laughs> but it's important that we understand the history of the church at Colossae so we understand what actually all of chapter 2 is, has been about and the, as we really need to understand what these two verses are all about. So we're going to take a little time in that this morning. So the church at Colossae had a fusion of Judaism and Gnostic mysticism. In short, the church was a mess. Much like most churches in America today. It was a mess. As we've been coming through chapter 2 and looking at, at the things that Paul is telling us, telling them and us by extension, he's telling them the truth. And he's giving them all of this truth to try to overcome the lies that they've been hearing and they've been being taught. Now, I've been following Paul's example and showing you the truth that he's laying out here, but I haven't been focusing on the bad teaching, his reasoning behind the truth that he was giving until today. I've been saving it for you. Do it all at once and get it over with, right? But today, I want to teach you a little about Gnostic mysticism. Just enough to give you the idea of the corruption that it is, and then we'll get into the scripture and explain what the antidote to that is. 
one of the teachings, and I'm not going to go into all of them, but one of the teachings of the Gnostics is that Jesus was a higher being. If you attend AA or some of the other secular self-help groups, that is the same higher power that they promote. Now, I'm not saying that these groups don't do some good. What I am saying, if your higher power is not Jesus Christ, it will not solve your problem. So they teach Jesus is a higher being, but not God. Paul has spent the entirety of chapter 2 blowing that teaching out of the water. From verse 1 all the way through, he is, he is pointing out to us that Jesus is God. And Jesus is man. And Jesus took our sin to the cross and he also took the law and the ordinances that was against us to the cross. Another of the Gnostic teachings is dualism. And that is the assumption of an eternal antagonism between God and matter. In other words, God is and always will be at odds with the creation. Okay. Truth is, right now, God is having some problems with His creation. God is not the problem. The creation is. And it is because of us. This just popped into my head. It's Romans chapter 8. Verse 22. Nope, verse 21. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Notice it says that it shall be. Verse 22. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, watch this, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. The whole creation is in travail because of us. You say, well, I didn't do anything wrong. Yes, you did. It actually started with Adam. It actually started with Lucifer, if you want to go all the way back. But we haven't helped anything. If your dog bites you, it's because of Adam's sin. So don't get mad at the dog. The whole creation is messed up because of sin. God is going to fix that. So this Gnostic dualism is wrong because it teaches that God will always be at odds with the creation. He will not always be at odds with the creation because He is going to fix it. It gets worse. They also hold to the demurgic notion which is the separation of the creator of the world the demurgos ghosts from the proper God in other words separation of the creator of the world so let me explain this demurrage 
is a derivative of the Greek word meaning craftsman. Plato used it for the divine being whose inferior deities form the world. Before your eyes glaze over, what that teaching is, is that God is not the creator, but the angels are. That's a lie. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. The majority of the Gnostic writers taught that angels made the world, not God. So the last of the Gnostic teachings that we're going to see today is Ducetism. And that is the resolution, now pay attention to this one, it is the resolution of the humanity of Christ into mere deceptive appearance. You missed that, didn't you? I'm going to make it easy. In other words, Jesus was not really a man. He just took on the appearance of a man. If that's the case, my friends, you and I are going to split hell wide open. So we might as well quit this nonsense and go party, right? But that's a lie. That's a total lie. Jesus Christ was born of the Virgin Mary. He was 100% man and 100% God. He was the God-man. If Jesus wasn't a man in the flesh, he could not redeem us. Praise God. He was a man in the flesh. So, we did all that because I wanted to give you an idea of what Paul was dealing with with this church. And what you find is the same teaching and or variations of it still in churches today. So we need to know this so that when we go out the doors, we know what we're dealing with, right? I got just one more thing that I want to share with you from the historical perspective. And that is this thing of angel worshiping. Angel worshiping is not something that was new to Paul and new in Paul's day. Angel worshiping has been going on historically documented since the Tower of Babel. Biblically documented since Genesis chapter 6. In Genesis chapter 6 and verse 1, the Bible says, And it came to pass, when men began to, began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God, the sons of God are angelic beings. Now I know some of you have probably heard somebody say, well the sons of God, that was the sons of, who's that guy? Adam's son? Seth. Seth, yeah, thank you. Guess what? It's not. Because the Bible says in Genesis chapter 5 that Seth was, was born in the image of Adam. By Genesis chapter 5, Adam was a fallen sinner. Seth was born a fallen sinner, not a son of God. Keep your Bible straight, you keep your life straight, right? So these sons of God are angelic beings. And so the sons of God saw the daughters of men that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. 
Yet his days shall be in 120 years. Now that is a very, very important verse right there, but we're not going to spend time on it today because it's not the verse I was looking for for today. Verse 4. There were giants in the earth in those days and also after that when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men and they bare children to them the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. So all the way back in Genesis chapter 6 the sons of God, these, these fallen angels, go read the book of Jude. I ain't got time for it this morning, but in Jude verse 6, it tells you about them. They gave up their first estate, and they, and they cohabit with the daughters of men, and they produce a race of giants. And people worship them from that moment all the way up to right now. They are men of renown. See, these, these giants, these men, are the offspring of the fallen angels. And they're still being worshipped. And I could go into that one the rest of the day, too. Because it goes a lot deeper. But see, back in Babel, the teaching went like this. Evil and good. Now watch this. Evil and good are twins born of Mother Nature. And you thought the New Age movement was new. It comes straight from the Tower of Babel. So they were twins born of Mother Nature. It began with light and darkness, then good and evil, Lucifer and Jesus, Cain and Abel, and on and on. That's why, my friends, there are churches today that teach that in the end, Jesus and Lucifer will make amends and everything's going to be okay. Well, I'm going to tell you something. In the end, everything is going to be okay because Lucifer is going to be in the lake of fire and Jesus is going to be on the throne. Amen. For eternity. They are not co-equal. They are, have nothing in common. Satan is a created being. Jesus is God in the flesh. But you see, that's why it doesn't matter if you worship Lucifer or Jesus. They're co-equal. That nonsense is being taught even today. Thousands of years later. So, I'm hoping by now that I've got your attention a little bit. Because I, I want to bring this thing home. I want, I want you to see where, where we are today and, and give you the scripture uh, to show you how this all fits together. But I want to begin by showing you why what we are seeing here right now is so critical to you and I, or me. However, it's supposed to say it. Because I want us to go to Colossians chapter 2 and look at verse 18. It says, Let no man beguile you of your reward. Stop right there. This is the emphasis statement of Paul's warning not only in these two verses but in the entire book of Colossians and especially in chapter 2. 
let no man beguile you of your reward. You have rewards that can be lost, stolen, or given away. The warning here is don't allow some man to beguile you of yours. Remember what happened in Genesis chapter 3? The serpent beguiled Eve. She lost her reward. So that, by the way. So don't let some man beguile you of yours. 2 John 1.8 says, Look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive, watch this, a full reward. So what is our reward? Well, if you're still in the book of Colossians, chapter 3 and verse 24 says, Knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. The reward of the inheritance. So what's your inheritance, you ask? See, I told you, you guys always ask exactly the right questions. Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17 tells us very clearly what our inheritance is. Romans chapter 8, verse 16, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs of God, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with Him, that way we may be also glorified together. So our reward, in a nutshell, if you will, our reward is to be joint heirs with Christ. Now that comes with a lot of things, like our reign with Him, our crowns, our clothing. There's a lot to lose. But our reward, singularly spoken, is our inheritance. It's we are joint heirs with Christ. Let me ask you a simple question. What is Christ heir of? How about everything? So what's your inheritance? Everything. So you have a lot to lose. A lot to lose. Jesus gave a warning to the church of Philadelphia in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 11. He says, Behold, I come quickly. Hold fast that which thou hast that no man take thy crown. So we have a crown. Actually, we have five of them, I think. That we can lose. Or a man can take it. Paul just warned us, you know, don't let somebody beguile you of your reward. Paul also gave a warning to Timothy. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12, where it says, It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with Him, we shall also live with Him. Speaking of Christ. If we suffer, we shall also reign with Him. If we deny Him, He also will deny us. Remember what we read in Romans chapter 8, verses 16 and 17? We are joint heirs with Christ. And we will reign with Him if we suffer with Him. If we refuse to suffer, and I don't know what your suffering is. I know what's, what mine is up to this point. I don't know what's going to be tomorrow. How do you handle it? Do you get mad and quit? Obviously, you don't. You're here. You've got to suffer with Him in order to reign with Him. And don't let some fool tell you that what Timothy's talking about there is that you, that you uh, will lose your salvation. Where it says if we deny him, he also no no no. And he talked about salvation. In that particular passage, in context, it's our reign with him. You can lose that. We have a lot to lose. 
when you look at all the warnings of which we've only looked at a very very few this morning there's a lot of them in there it's obvious that God wants us to have all that he has prepared for us we should be concerned about that as well Paul is warning don't allow anybody to cause you to lose your reward in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3 he says but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity of that is in Christ. The message of salvation is very simple. Christ died for your sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day according to the scripture. Now that's simple. Confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God hath raised him from the dead and thou shalt be saved. That's simple. You believe what the Bible says. You confess to God you're a sinner and He's right, you're wrong. Ask Him to be your Savior, you're saved. It's that simple. Oh, but man gets a hold of it. A matter of well, you might think it's that simple, but you've got to do such and such and so and so in order to be saved. That's a lie. What you have to do is believe in your heart that Christ died for your sins, that He was buried, that He rose again the third day according to the Scripture for your sin and mine, and then at, tell Him, hey, I believe it. Won't you save me? And you know what He says? Yeah, sure I will. It's that simple, folks. But that's what Paul's warning is here. Don't let some man convince you that there's something more than the simplicity of salvation. There's not. There's nothing you can do to be saved except admit that you're a sinner. And Jesus wasn't. And He died for you. He did it all as far as the works are concerned. You just have to accept it. If I had, if I had a, a, a $100 bill, I was going to say a thousand, but there ain't no chance in the world that I would ever have a thousand dollar bill. Say I have a hundred dollar bill. And I say, look, I have a hundred dollar bill. I'm going to put it right here. It's yours if you come and take it. Now, if I go to the rest of the service, this ain't going to happen. But if I go to the rest of the service and nobody comes up and takes that hundred dollar bill, at the end of the day, I walk down there, pick it up, put it back in my pocket, go, thank you, Jesus, and I go home with my hundred dollar bill and you get nothing unless I preach a good message then you get that salvation the same way it's free it's right there for you but you have to take it Amen. that's the simplicity that's in Christ now I'm going to tell you something there are plenty of of these silver-tongued serpents still around today. Oh, there's plenty of them. Airways are full of them. They're out there. Okay. Let me open a window on some reality for you here right now before we move on. In order that you could lose your reward, your crowns, your clothing, your reign, in order for you to lose any of those things, you must first have them. So here's the deal. When you got saved, God gave you everything everything 
That's why he's warning you not to lose it. He gave you everything. And then, because he knows us, he says, I'm going to give him a book. And in the book, I'm going to tell him how to keep everything I gave him. So here's my point. If you get to heaven, and if you're a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, you are going to get to heaven. But if you get to heaven, and you suddenly discover that you don't have a crown, you look down and you ain't got no clothes, it's your fault. God gave it to you. You didn't retain it. You're not going to stand before Jesus and say, I didn't know. I think that's going to carry any weight. Especially if you've been in this message, hearing this message this morning. Because now you know. Now you know. You got it all at the moment of salvation. Let me tell you something. If you, if you, if you would have gotten, uh, if you would have had a heart attack and died at the moment, the very instant that you got saved, when you got to heaven, you would have all the crowns. You would have on bright white raiment. You would be reigning for eternity with Jesus Christ. Because at that moment, at that instant, you was absolutely perfect. You was just exactly like Jesus. But I'm looking around the room. You're all still breathing. You're all still here. And you've messed up since that moment. Let reality sink in, folks. You got it all. You just need to keep it. You just need to keep it. You cannot live this life earning anything. You live this life retaining what God gave you. It's important that you know the difference. That's why these two verses are so very important. That's why I put these two verses in a separate category all by themselves instead of mixing them in with the rest of this chapter. It's all about reward, retained or lost. So let's talk about worshiping of angels. Colossians chapter 2, verse 18 says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Let me ask you a question. Be honest. How many of you have ever seen an angel? So I thought. Bible's still true, right? Amen. I want to show you something about worshiping angels. Take your Bibles and go to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. I got to speed this up. I'm going to run out of time. See, that's the problem. I wasn't here last week, so I had two weeks to work on this. So. Now I got to figure out how to get it all done in one day. Revelation chapter 22, verses 8 and 9. Verse 8 says, And I, John, saw these things and heard them, and when I heard and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel which shewed me these things. Now look at verse 9. Then saith he unto me, See, thou do it not, for I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren the prophets, and of them which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. The first thing that you and I need to know is that a good angel will not allow you to worship them. You also need to know that all the angels 
are not good. In Job chapter 1 and verse 6, the Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now look, folks, I'm pretty sure that Satan ain't hanging out with the good guys. That's not where he spends his time. So they show up to present themselves before the Lord. You know what that shows us without going into the rest of the verses? God's in control. Even of Satan and the fallen angels. Go back to Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12. We're just going to look at verses 7 through 9. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7. It says, And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels. So you refer that back to Job chapter 1 and verse 6. It's the sons of God, right? Okay, just keeping it straight. Verse 8. And prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Now, I don't know what you know about Bible prophecy, but there is a thing in Bible prophecy called a double fulfillment prophecy. There was a time back then when Satan and his angels, you can read about it in the book of Job chapter 9, is, is a good place to start. Satan and his angels went to war against God and his angels. There was war in heaven. A whole lot of things happened. And they was cast out. And they was cast to the earth. They was here in Genesis chapter 6. We already read that. And, and, and the verse says, and after that. They've been here a lot. Go to Quick Trip sometime. They're still here. I'm just saying. It doesn't have to be Quick Trip. You can go in any, any establishment in the world. I just Quick Trip pop into my head because that's where last I seen some. Anyway. Where'd I go? Okay. They will allow you to worship them. But the other fulfillment of this is going to be in about three and a half years from today. Right in the middle of the seven year tribulation. And I'm thinking God's kids are going to take us out today. Tribulation is going to start and we'll be out of here. Right in the middle of the tribulation, this war takes place again. And they're cast out of the second heaven this time. And they're cast down to the earth. I'm not going to get into all that. It's not necessary. But what I wanted us to see is that Satan wasn't hanging out. He was, in fact, the leader of the fallen angels. They are his angels. Revelation chapter 9 and verse 11 tells us that he is the angel of the bottomless pit. Revelation chapter 20 verses 1 through 3 confirm that fact. And he's got his co-workers with him. Galatians chapter 1, verses 6 through 9. says, I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Now watch this. Which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Here's the point that Paul's making. There is only one gospel. It's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the first four verses. The death, burial, and glorious resurrection of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. If somebody is preaching another gospel, it's not really a gospel. They're just claiming it to be a gospel. That's what he's telling the Galatians here. Verse 8. But though we or an angel from heaven 
preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. So Paul's telling them, he said, even if I come in and preach another gospel, or an angel comes in and preaches another gospel, let him be accursed. Something important to note in that verse. Paul has noted that it would be possible for him to be oppressed and directed of Satan to teach something that wasn't true. That's why I tell you continuously, my friends, do not ever take everything that I say as the gospel truth. I could be saying something that's not exactly right. Not that I want to. Not that I have any desire to mislead anybody. But if it could happen, Paul was concerned about it. If it could happen to him, it could happen to me. That's why I tell you continually, take notes. Check it out. Make sure that what I'm telling you is the truth. That's why I use so much Scripture. Because I want you to prove me wrong or right. Either way. But prove me. It's your responsibility. Paul is warning us here to do that. That's what he says. If we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. Verse 9, As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. So let's summarize what we found so far. God's good angels will not allow you to worship them. So, if you are worshiping angels, they have to be Satan's fallen angels. Because if they wouldn't, they would not allow it. Back in Colossians chapter 2 and verse 18. Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Paul says, don't let anyone, anyone beguile you to deceive you into worshiping angels. If you do, bad things are going to happen. Take your Bibles and turn to 2 Kings. 2 Kings. I'm going to have to hurry up here, so I'm going to hurry. 2 Kings chapter 21, verses 1 through 9. Manasseh's Manasseh was 12 years old when he began to reign. And he reigned 50 and 5 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Hesphabah. And he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. After the abominations of the heathen whom the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. For he built up again the high places which Hezekiah his father had destroyed and reared up altars for Baal and made a grove as did Ahab king of Israel and worshipped all the host of heaven and served them. Now that would be Satan and his angels and don't get it confused. Verse 4, And he built altars in the house of the Lord which the Lord had said in Jerusalem will I put my name and he built altars for all the host of heaven in the two courts of the house of the Lord. And he made his son pass through the fire and observe times and used enchantments and dealt with familiar spirits and wizards. 
He wrought much wickedness in the sight of the Lord to provoke him to anger. And he set a graven image of, of the grove that he had made in the house of which the Lord said to David and to Solomon his son, In this house in Jerusalem, which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Neither will I make the feet of Israel move any more out of the land which I gave their fathers only if they will observe to do according to all that I have commanded them and according to all the law that my servant Moses commanded. But they hearkened not, and Manasseh seduced them to do more evil than did the nations whom the Lord destroyed before the children of Israel. Following a man and not following God. Causing their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire. So what happened? Manasseh dies right after him comes Josiah. Verse 22, Josiah was eight years old when he began to reign. He was a good guy. King Josiah, very good king. But then what happened? He died. Go to chapter 23. 2 Kings chapter 23, verse 4. And the king commanded Hilkiah, Hilkiah I'm sorry, the high priest and the priest of the second order and the keepers of the door to bring forth out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels that were made for Baal and for the grove and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them without Jerusalem in the fields of Kidron and carried the ashes of them to Bethel. And he put down the idolatrous priest whom the kings of Judah had ordained to burn incense in the high places in the cities of Judah and the places round about Jerusalem. And them also that burned incense unto Baal, to the sun and to the moon and to the planets and to all the hosts of heaven. And he brought out the grove from the house of the Lord without Jerusalem unto the brook Kidron and burned it in, at the brook Kidron and stamped it small to powder and cast the powder thereupon the graves of the children of Israel and break down the houses of the Sodomites that were by the house of the Lord where the women wove hangings for the grove. And he brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense uh, from Geba to Beersheba and break down the high places of the gates that were in, in the entering in of the gate Josiah, Joshua the governor of the city which were on a man's left and hand at the gate I look at verse 9 nevertheless the priest of the high places came not up, out of, up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem but they did eat of the unleavened bread among their brethren Over and over in the Word of God, the nation of Israel was warned, and they was warned, and they was warned, and they didn't care. They did their own thing. They did what they wanted to do. I want to assure you that Israel didn't start out when they started following these other gods, they didn't start out thinking, man, I can't wait to run my son through the fire. They weren't thinking about burning their children as an offering to Moloch. But guess what? They did it. When you start dabbling, it gets worse and worse until you're destroyed. That's why we're warned to stay away from it. Stay away from it. So with the warning, 
There has to be a solution, right? There has to be a solution. Go back to Colossians chapter 2. Paul was a good news preacher too. Verse 19. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 19. And not holding the head from which all the body by joints and bands having nourishment ministered and knit together increaseth with the increase of God. The solution, my friends, is to keep Christ, who is the head, in His rightful position. See, it's the head that keeps the rest of the body in line. Christ is the head. Go ahead and go to Ephesians chapter 1. He knew we was going there at some point anyway, right? Ephesians chapter 1. See, the thing that Paul tells us here in verse 19 is true of everything. It's true in the family. The reason that we have so much problems in our society today is that most of the families don't have a head of family. And when you don't have a head to follow, you just run amok. The reason most of the churches are in the mess that they're in today is because Christ is not the head. The preacher is. Or the leaders, the deacons, or whatever they call them. Ephesians chapter 1, beginning in verse 17. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him, we're speaking of Christ here, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, <clears throat> Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom all ye also are built together of an habitation of God through the Spirit. If you look at the church as a building, Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. I don't know what you know about construction, but if you're doing construction and you have a cornerstone and you take it out, the building collapses. If you have a life and you leave Jesus out, it collapses. If you have a church and you leave Jesus out, it collapses. He is the head. He is what guides and directs the body. The problem that we face is not that any one of us is necessarily going around and worshiping Satan. The problem is we get off track in the little things. The little things. You know, those little insignificant things. I'm not going to name them for you. But don't you see how it is? How it always goes? Look, look. 
God told the children of Israel to take the land and kill every man, woman, and child, and all the beasts because they were defiled and that the children of Israel would be defiled if they didn't destroy them. So what happens? They go into the land and the women were beautiful. And so they say, okay, just kill the ugly ones. And they did. And they kept the beautiful ones for themselves. And they see the sheep. And they go, wow, those are some good sheep. We'll keep the good ones. We'll kill the others. And we'll sacrifice some of these good ones to God and he'll be okay. That's exactly what Saul tried to do. Go read that story. I don't have time for it right now. We'll just keep the choice ones. And it went on and on like that. The next thing you know, they're turned from God to idols. And then in a little while, they begin to sacrifice even their children to these idols. 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 9 says, And the children of Israel did secretly those things that were not right against the Lord their God, and they built them high places in all their cities from the tower of the watchman to the fence city. Now let me ask you a question. What in the world do you think that you can do that is in secret from God? Well, I'm going to tell you what it is. Absolutely nothing. Verse 10, And they set them up images and groves in every high hill and under every green tree. And there they burnt incense in all the high places, in all the high places, as did the heathen whom the Lord carried away before them and wrought wicked things to provoke the Lord to anger. For they served idols whereof the Lord had said unto them, Ye shall not do this thing. My friends, when you begin to make excuses for violating the Word of God, you start down a slippery slope that leads to despair. I'm not going to go into the idols and the images and talk to you about your new car and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> I'm not. I like cars too. But I want to tell you, they can become a God to you. An idol, a false god, is anything that comes between you and God. It can be another person. It can be your dog, your cat. I don't see how a cat could make an image good. It could be anything. But that's how it starts. It's the little things. Oh, well, there won't be any problem with having this little uh, statue of Jesus over here. Until you have a problem and you walk by the statue and go. I'm just saying. Paul is warning us. Keep the head. Christ. Keep him the head. Make him the driving force. The guide for everything that you do in your life. Christ is the head of the church. Christ is the head of the life. And don't allow men to beguile you into thinking a little deviation from the road that God has you on is okay. It's not. When you come to a fork in the road, you must pray before you make the decision of which fork you're going to take, which direction you're going to take. Because one of them is going to be wrong. And it will take you to places that you should not go, to do things that you should not do, and it will do it every day. You may not even notice it at first. But before you realize what happened, you're offering sacrifices to idols. And you've lost your reward. Oh, you're going to heaven. 
naked and destitute, but you're going to heaven. I've had people tell me, I don't care. As long as I know I'm going to heaven, I don't care. If you have that attitude, let me just say this to you, and I want to be as clear as I can be. If that's your attitude, you are a fool. I hope I made that clear. You're a fool. If your goal in life is just to get to heaven, Second Corinthians chapter five and verse three says, "If so, if so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked." Now I've had people tell me, "I'm not worried about being naked in heaven." Revert back to what I just said. You're a fool. Maybe you're a fool because you don't know. But if not, then you're a fool because you don't care. Read your Bible. Revelation 3.18 I counsel thee, this is Jesus speaking, I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve that thou mayest see. Imagine making your grand entrance into heaven naked. The shame of the Lord. A glorified body and nothing on it. Jesus warned you. That's to the church of the Laodiceans. That's us. We need to pay attention to the Bible. There's verses in the Bible that says that in the mouth of two or three witnesses a thing is established. I gave you two witnesses right there. You can't appear in heaven a born-again believer in Jesus Christ, destitute and naked. And you're going to have to explain to Jesus how you lost everything that He died to give you. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8, and I'm going to be done. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. The warnings are clear. The warnings are very clear. We need to heed them. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and thank you for loving us. Father God, I just pray that this message today would go out would permeate the hearts of the people. Father, I know what you've done to me over these last few weeks to get me to where I needed to be. Sometimes we all need a little schooling. And I thank you for it. I thank you, Lord. And Father, I pray for every individual that hears this message today or that watches the video that they'll pay attention they'll look at the scripture they'll allow your Holy Spirit to teach and to guide and to direct and Father God I pray that if anybody hears this message anybody watches this video anybody hears this message by however means, whatever means, they hear it by, that they would understand that they need Jesus to be their Lord, to be their Savior. He died for that cause and to that end. He was buried and He rose again the third day for that very purpose. Father, that they would call upon Him to be their Savior. And I ask this in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen.